Hello, we are continuing our overview of the Yokohama Manifesto, and we are now on chapter 5, which is written by Glaviano and Wagner. This chapter is about two very important concepts, psychological concepts, namely memory and creativity. It is a historical study, mindful of culture and the impact of culture on our understanding of psychological concept, and also of the impact of the history of psychology. And it is, generally speaking, a very good example of how it is important to grasp in advance before doing empirical studies. It is important to examine our understanding of psychological concepts, for example, memory and creativity. It is extremely important to understand something about creativity before we have measures of creativity, before we order or identify a group of people in terms of their creativity or in terms of their memory. It is important to know something about uh, that. And the moment we have a measure of memory or a measure of creativity, it is inevitable that some understanding, some definition of these concepts is, is uh, operating in the background. So it is better to be aware of them. Let's begin by considering a view that the authors challenge and reject. What is this view? It is a view that sees memory and creativity as opposite phenomena. Uh, according to this view, memory and creativity are psychological processes that are moving in opposite directions. On the one hand, we have memory, which is associated with the past, and it has to do with good memory, good remembering, it has to do with accurately recollecting, retrieving something from the past, and taking something, a presentation in experience, and doubling it, representing it. So it has to do with faithful representation, recollection, retrieval. On the other hand, we have creativity, which is associated not with the past, but with the future, with breaking from the past or even forgetting the past. It is also associated with certain type of individuals, maybe, like the so-called geniuses, these creative individuals who are necessarily different from the rest of society. They are alone and they suffer because they don't, they don't fit. And the advantage of that is that they have these creative ideas or behaviors. So, I just talked about an understanding of memory and an understanding of uh, creativity that sets these two concepts in opposition to each other. The authors reject this picture. They reject the view that memory is exact reproduction of the past that is about accuracy, is only about accuracy. That the more stuck you are in the past, the better you are at rem remembering something. That's the kind of image that is consistent with opposition between remembering and cre creating. In contrast to that view, remembering is constructive. It is creative. It has, it can have different styles. We can have different styles, uh, ways of remembering something. And remembering can be future-oriented. It is not necessary that by remembering we are just oriented towards the past. So, for example, if I remember my grandmother who has passed away, I can remember her in a way that orients me towards the future. I can remember her in such a way that highlights the lessons that I have learned from her and how I want to embody, enact those lessons in my future days. So uh, the authors also reject the view that creativity is individualistic, that it comes out of the individual without the help of the context and the society and collaboration, cooperation. And that creativity reflects a break from the past that creativity has nothing to do with repetition or with tradition. Those are, those are not accurate statements to say about creativity because without tradition, without repetition, without some form of repetition, we won't even know if something is new or if something is useful without having a tradition as a background of evaluating. Now, let's talk about, now that I have established the author's positions, let's talk about how we can recreate that mistaken dichotomy, that opposition between memory and creativity. Let's set up a scenario and see if we can reverse engineer the mistake that the authors critique. Let's imagine a simple scenario. There is one person in a room. The room is almost empty. And the person is standing in front of the only object that is in the room, and that is a yellow umbrella. After spending some time in the room alone, the person, she comes out and reports to a friend what she saw in the room. She says, I saw in the empty room, I saw a yellow object or a yellow umbrella. 
And she's right. If she says that, we would say she is remembering correctly, faithfully. She would also be right if uh, she were to say, I saw a yellow umbrella that was closed, that was dry, and it was placed against the wall near the corner of the room. All those additional informations would also be correct. She can also say, I touched the handle of the umbrella and it felt like it was made of ivory. Her act of remembering or acts of remembering have to be appropriate to why she is communicating with her friend. If the friend is in a rush or if the friend is impatient, her report is, we would expect her report to be brief. If the friend is curious, by contrast, if the friend is very interested and wants to hear more, then her report will be longer, more extensive, more detailed. And she will remember more. She, maybe she will remember differently. Maybe our person will not talk about the umbrella. Maybe uh, she will, instead of talking, instead of using the medium of speech, maybe she will write about it. Maybe she will write yellow umbrella or almost empty room. Or maybe she will draw an umbrella and, and the room. And by uh, matching the scale as much as she can, she can give us an idea of how big the room was or how big the umbrella or the relative size and relative location of the umbrella relative to the room. These variations in remembering and variations in report help us see, so recognizing that it is possible to report differently and to actually remember differently, emphasize in our acts of remem remembering, emphasize different aspects of the situation. Recognizing these help us see that there is, first of all, decisions involved in remembering. And second, that there is a medium in which the yellow umbrella is represented, remembered, and shared. So the first medium that I mentioned was the medium of speech, spoken words. It could also be the medium of written word, it could be a medium of drawing, and it could be a movement. A person could pantomime that there is, I saw an object like this. Now, imagine that there is, uh, in addition to the original person who went to the room and came back and reported what they saw, imagine that there is a not very smart person outside the room who is feeling extremely confident and has, a, in fact, a false sense of confidence, um, seeing himself as omniscient about what is in the room and how the content of the room should be remembered, should be described. This person, this know-it-all, overconfident person, believes that anyone who goes into the room and comes out should write on a piece of paper, yellow umbrella, and hand it over to him. So that's the way to report, to remember, to perform this task. That is, I should emphasize this, that this person, this know-it-all person, let's call him an experimental psychologist. This know-it-all individual has a specific operational definition of remembering, which has, among other things, it has fixed the medium in which the yellow umbrella is remembered. A fixed idea of how one ought to accurately remember something. So by doing that, he is neglecting possible variations in remembering. He's neglecting that there are so many other ways of describing the object, the room. We can expand the amount of detail, how in depth, how much information we are, how many attributes we are deciding to share. And the form and the medium of remembering could also change. This person is neglecting that we can think, uh, it is possible to think differently in a way that is unanticipated by one observer. Two observers will go into the room and they come out and they say different things about the same object. They remember the situation differently. So once we realize that there is no one omniscient observer who is evaluating our acts of remembering according to some ultimate objective standards, that any act of memory is selective, results from decisions, we see the constructive or creative character of memory. And we realize that the two concepts, memory and creativity, are intimately tied. So I, I went over the connection between memory and creativity from one path, one possible direction. It, there is another road Another road is possible to begin from creativity and show the central role of memory in, in creativity. 
But I will leave that up to you. If you go to the chapter, you will see the author's own argument. They connect uh, both creativity to memory and memory to creativity. And they will do much more in the chapter if you read them. Especially the historical side of the chapter is very interesting. But I will stop now and we'll continue with chapter 6 in the next part. Thank you very much for your attention.